In partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation, please welcome back to Concordia, uh, Andy Serwer, Editor-in-Chief from Yahoo Finance, and Dr. Rajiv Shah, President of the Rockefeller Foundation. Andy? Thanks very much. Yep, I'm Andy. That's Raj. Hey, Raj, how are you doing? Hey, Andy, good to be with you. Good to see you again. Um, I'll just to give people a little uh, flavor for what goes on maybe behind the scenes. We were talking in the virtual green room with Patrick and Wendy about uh, some of the work that you were doing, Raj, and Wendy was congratulating you um, and the work that the Rockefeller Foundation have been doing over the past several months in regard to COVID and the leadership role that you guys have assumed. And so I wanted to say thank you for the work that uh, you guys are doing. It's, it's really tremendous. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andy. It's also great to follow uh, Patrick and Wendy. You know, here are two people who've committed their lives to educating kids and adults at home and around the world and have made a huge, huge difference. And if you ever question whether like a small group of awesome leaders can really change the world for lots and lots of kids and their aspirations, those are two that have proved you can. Right. Absolutely. Let's Let's talk, though, about what's transpired this year, which has just been so difficult for so many uh, billions of people, really. And I want to ask you about COVID and, and the notion that I think that you guys are putting forth that it really is affecting the world um, in an unequal fashion and exacerbating inequality. Can you explain that a little bit? And why is that the case, Raj? Yeah, well, well COVID has exposed Inequality, you know, we, we know that lower income and minority communities at home in the United States and around the world are far, far, far more likely to suffer the consequences of COVID. In the United States, a black American is five times more likely to be hospitalized than the general population. And if there was a period of time early in the summer where the single greatest factor of dying, if you were in a nursing home, was being black. And because COVID was so selective in its uh, mortality consequences. And so, you know, if you if you are in the United States, you have two worlds. You have a world where, you know, everyone has experienced a death in their family or in their neighborhood or in their community. Some have seen people buried in mass graves uh, while the rest of the world goes on. And, and there's a whole nother world where COVID is something you hear about and you wear a mask because it's, it's what you're supposed to do, ideally. Uh, but you, you sometimes even question if it's real. And, uh, and you know, that's because it is fundamentally uh, deepening a deep inequity in, in the United States. And by the way, that's true around the world. Uh, the indigenous population in Brazil has a three times higher mortality rate than the general population in Brazil. Uh, if you look in India, the states that are lowest income and most densely populated, have uh, testing positivity rates above 20, 25%. Unheard of numbers, numbers that mean you're on a rocket ship and you've just taken off on the launch pad. And those are states, by the way, that are not small states. Maharashtra has 117 million people in it and a 23 or 24% testing positivity rate. So, so around the world, we're seeing COVID uh, really bear its worst consequences on those who are lower income, those who are minority or marginalized populations, uh, those who are indigenous. And we're going to see that, unfortunately, Andy, in the recovery. Uh, you know, the, the richer part of the world, industrial nations have spent somewhere between six and ten trillion dollars already. Six and a half, I think, is the G7 estimate for those nations on fiscal stimulus in much of the emerging world. That level of fiscal stimulus, you know, three, four, five percent of GDP is simply not possible in the short term. And so you see 24 percent GDP decline in India, a country with 1.3 billion people. And as a result of that kind of dynamic globally, the World Bank is estimating that for the first time since World War II, almost 500 million people around the world in poor countries will be pushed back into poverty. And just let that sink in. 500 million people pushed back into poverty while, you know, the 600 billionaires in America have made half a trillion dollars because of awesome digital acceleration and all these great tools we have to kind of get through this crisis. So, yes, it is deepening inequity. It is exacerbating inequity. And unless we take some bold, clear actions from a global perspective, I suspect 
we will have a world that is much, much different than we want 10 years out. Yeah, I'm glad you noted that uh, point about the, the billionaires. I mean, it's cruelly ironic that those people are benefiting, um, you know, inadvertently, though it may be, um, through this crisis because of the adoption of their technologies. But, but let me ask you specifically about um, the people who are in need and, and your mandate, Russ. So what is Rockefeller doing about it and how is that connected to your mandate? Well, I, well, I think the first thing we did was just we see COVID-19 as the crisis of our time. Uh, we believe it's going to have a longer tail than most people realize. We felt that back in March. And so we quickly mobilized $100 million and committed ourselves to supporting testing and contact tracing at home and around the world. Uh, We've, in particular for the United States, created a national testing action plan and strategy, worked with Congress to secure uh, $25 billion of funding for that strategy. We now work with uh, 37 cities, states, and localities, including two Native American nations, and are providing tens of millions of tests. Uh, tests basically to people who who need them in vulnerable communities, and I think it's it's Rockefeller supported projects, but but leaders from Johns Hopkins, from great universities, uh, from local community leaders in Atlanta and Baltimore that are proving that this disease requires an equity first public health response. Um, are the community health corps we set up in Baltimore, reaching African American low income population, having a bigger impact on preventing contagion than if it had been a generalized statewide en- en- enterprise? And the same is true around the nation. So, by transforming testing as a core strategy for America to have a way out between either strict economic lockdowns or just runaway death toll from an out of control pandemic. We think we can get to a place by December or January where they're, you know, our target for January is 200 million tests a month being in the market. Right now we have about 25 million. When we started this enterprise, we were doing about 500,000 tests a week, so less than uh, less than three million tests a month. And and no one thought it was possible, but it is possible. It's possible because of new technology in the biotech space and and some unique things we've done with others. Uh, but if we get to 200 million tests a month, the American economy essential workers, vulnerable populations should be far more protected uh, from, you know, the consequences of COVID in 2021 and 2022. Right, which obviously helps all facets of society, one would imagine. I I want to ask you about working with the private sector and the public sector, public-private partnerships in these endeavors. I mean, that's sort of a focal point of Concordia, NGOs working um, with both of the other sides of the aisle. Is that something you're keen on? It is. I think that's why they have us here at Concordia. <laughs> and, and, we, and we admire what they do at Concordia for that reason. I mean, take the testing work I just talked about, you know, you know by putting together a collaboration between governments. In this case, we work with 10 states and have secured advanced purchase commitments for 5 million antigen tests. We've been able to accelerate the development and introduction of these tests. They're they're much faster. They're, they turn results around in 15, 20 minutes instead of four to seven days. They're cheaper, uh, 10, 15, 20 dollars as opposed to 100, 120 dollars. And they are a little bit less sensitive, but frankly, for screening purposes and and for the rest of the world, they're going to be the answer for the next you know 24 months. So we we're doing that in in the United States, in India in parts of Africa and in Latin America, and we're not going to get through COVID without a serious public-private partnership. And I think the same has to be true for the economic recovery. We have, I think you and I have had a chance to speak previously about one of the things I'm very proud of is we launched a billion-dollar joint venture with Tata Power in India to build out 10,000 rural mini-grids. These are solar installations with battery backup and artificial intelligence remote management, but they provide power yeah, and our plan was to provide power to 25 million people who otherwise live in the dark. That kind of enterprise is more necessary now than ever, and require and we need more of those public-private partnerships with Tata in India. We're working with half a dozen companies in Africa. We're working with partners in Puerto Rico to make sure that as we recover from this crisis, we do it with a sense of equity, and we do it with a sense of sustainability and climate. Um, considerations kind of as a priority. You know, one thing I'm curious about, Raj, I mean, you mentioned that this is the crisis 
maybe of our lifetime. I hope we don't get one that's worse anytime soon. Um, do you do you change your your spend? I mean, you know, I'm curious. You say Darren Walker. You say, okay, look, our budget is going to be very different this year. Yeah. So I think actually uh, the answer normally is no, and that's the wrong answer. So this year we we did it. I think right. Uh, we changed everything. I mean, by by the middle of March, with the great support of our board, we just said this is this is a moment. Rockefeller was created. 107 years ago, we were a big part of the fight against the 1918 flu pandemic. We incubated inside the Rockefeller Foundation, the precursor to the World Health Organization, which was an international public health committee of the League of Nations. And <laughs> we spun it out. And I'm like, if an institution with that kind of reach and, and network isn't, isn't able to kind of go big on COVID response now, uh, then who can we expect to turn to? So we, we in fact did mobilize a lot of special financing. We shut some efforts down and we put resources into, into this uh, special one-time effort. And as a result, we're able to support testing and tracing on you know three, four continents in the, around the world and doing it at scale with country governments and importantly with the manufacturers of, of test kits and other supplies that are a critical part of the fight. Wow, that's great to hear that. It really is. And let me ask you, you know, sometimes people, ordinary citizens want to know what can they do to help? How can they get involved, either maybe with you guys or just generally speaking? Do you have any thoughts along those lines, Raj? I do. I do. I, first, I think ordinary citizens, there's no one's ordinary, right? Everybody has has some special gift, some sense of light and hopefulness that they can bring to this work. And, and so we have a deep commitment to getting broad participation in these efforts. We, we have actually created a vehicle we call Rockefeller Catalytic Capital, in order to mobilize other philanthropic resources for those who want to participate and do their philanthropy with us. And I would be happy to take uh, resources from, you know, uh, folks who can give in small increments, as well as those who can give in very large increments. We've been more successful, frankly, in the very large increments. We have a, a co-impact fund, for example, that's raised a few hundred million dollars from giving pledge families. These are the wealthiest families in America that have committed to give half of their assets to philanthropy and have chosen to partner with the Rockefeller Foundation in how they do some of that giving. Uh, but you don't have to have billions of dollars or or you, we, we take uh, resources in much smaller increments than hundreds of millions. And frankly, I, I think it would be great. And one of the things we're exploring is how to use this new platform to get schools and, and you know people who have a commitment to give back even in small increments, uh, to be a part of the process because it's the learning, it's the knowledge, it's the ideas that come from people who kind of educate themselves about global poverty, global health, fighting pandemics, inequity in, in the American society and what you can do about it that ultimately is the real power that philanthropy has to offer. Philanthropy as a sector is a tiny part of the global economy. Philanthropy as a place that can support great ideas is very special. The, and, and to give you one anecdote about that, 40 years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation offered a fellowship to an ACLU lawyer who uh, wanted to kind of get her thinking on some cases she had just tried. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg published one of her early pieces of seminal thought about women and Supreme Court rulings as a result of that fellowship. So come join our platform for ideas and people, and, and we welcome all comers. Wow, that's a that is a great anecdote. Yeah, cool. We just have a little bit of time left, and and it's it's really unfortunate we sort of short shrifted it. But there's two other, at least two other huge issues of our time uh, this year, which is racial and social justice and climate change. Both are, are are huge pressing problems, and I'm just wondering, do you have to put those to the side? Can you also address how do you deploy your your bandwidth and your resources now? Yeah, they're all. I know we're we're very tight on time, but we're, they're all part of the same mission. You know, it's it's true. It's actually true. If you want to address COVID in America, focus on African American and minority communities. It is a tragedy that some African American kid, both is like is far more likely to experience a COVID related death event in his family, and then walk out walks out the street and feels unsafe in a country that is, you know, still not able to make every American citizen feel safe in their bodies. That is injustice in every step of the way. And we should be 
working on all of that together. These things are so deeply intertwined. And the same is true for climate. If we're going to recover from this, uh, this crisis, we can either do it on the backs of you know, major coal investments and traditional global development, or we can think differently and invest in the kind of green solutions you and I talked about that you know, can bring a billion people out of poverty, but do it without the heavy carbon footprint that, that we all created when we moved our economies into the industrial future. Well, obviously, so much more to talk about there and with regard to COVID, but we are out of time. So Raj Shah, Dr. Raj Shah, thank you so much, uh, President of the Rockefeller Foundation. Great to see you. Thanks, Andy. Nice to see you again, too.